I'm Sam Swope, and on behalf of the Academy for Teachers, uh, it's good to have you at our first masterclass of the 2020-2021 school year. Our masterclass is bringing exceptional teachers like you from public, charter, and private schools together with leading experts in all fields. We believe it's important for you guys to learn from the best minds in our culture, because that will help keep you inspired as you do the most important job on earth, as we are start as many people are starting to realize today. Today's class is led by Khalil Gibran Muhammad. He's the grandson of Elijah Muhammad, who led the nation of Islam. Islam, the son of Ozir Muhammad, who uh, won a Pulitzer Prize and took photographs for the New York Times. But it will be especially meaningful to the folks in this class to know that Khalil's mom was a teacher, as is Khalil himself at Harvard and at the Radcliffe Institute. And he was formerly director of the Schomburg Center, a research library familiar to many of the teachers in this room, I'm sure. And he's the author of a book that many of you have used in your classrooms, The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Modern Urban America. Khalil, the teachers in this class were chosen from a great many applicants. They're an impressive group with advanced degrees in education and the arts, as well as PhDs, degrees in law and divinity. They teach English, Spanish, history, science, math, and the arts to fortunate children, gay grades K through early college in schools in New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Ohio. They've been teaching between three and 35 years, and the total number of years they've been in the classroom is 682. They teach between 10 and 1,000 kids, and the number of children who know their names, and that is this year alone, is 5,408. And you can bet that every one of them is going to benefit from what their teachers experience with you today. So thank you, Khalil, for doing this. Thank you, teachers. And it is the Academy's pleasure to bring you all together. <laughs> You're muted, Khalil. All right, sorry about that. Great. Well, it's an honor to be invited back uh, to participate in the Academy for Teachers. Big fan um, of, of the community that uh, Sam and his team has put together. And uh, as I said to folks in my breakout group, um, uh, I had pretty good teachers, but I know they would have been better uh, if they'd had wonderful opportunities like this. Um, so in any case, thank you. Thank you, Sam, and all who, who make this all possible. Um, so. I need to share my screen so I can get started. And uh, let me just go ahead and do that. All right, and here you go. So everyone sees the lead slide? Excellent. All right, so as, as Sam knows, um, I released the second edition of uh, my book, which largely includes a new preface. Um, ironically enough, I wrote it more or less uh, on the cusp of Eric Garner's um, uh, mother's uh, failure to get a conviction, a meaningful conviction of Daniel Pantaleo um, last summer. And uh, I was resubmitting or say, should I say submitting the preface. So while I don't talk about Eric Garner in it, that certainly was part of the conversation last summer. Um, last summer was also, as you know, from having read the preface, the 100th anniversary of the Chicago race riot, uh, which very much um, is part of the moment that we are living through now in terms of the historical echoes. Uh, so in any case, um, when I did the talk many years ago, I didn't focus on policing as the central thread. I talked about the role of data, of which policing is a big part of it, but the book changed. And I just want to point out that this is a protest um, from 1938 in Washington, D.C. And here are two young men um, featured in the foreground uh, as part of that moment. And it invites us to think about how visual culture itself is a rich primary source for being able to draw the connections uh, between the past and the present that are meaningful for students to see in their own life's journey, uh, the work that is required and the challenges that they face. Uh, I think it's also fascinating that if you gave students an assignment uh, to look through 
uh, newspapers online or other online services or social media, I bet you they could find signs about uh, I might be next or you might be next. I just saw one on the news two days ago uh, at uh, a or more recent protest. So just thinking about pedagogical approaches uh, that both bring the past and present to life. So um, I use these words quite uh, often and I sort of always use this um, just to be clear about what th these differences are because they're meaningful. And so um, these are key words. Uh, they're not common, common parlance and in a country that likes simplicity at the expense of actually learning what it is that makes our society work, I thought it's important to just uh, lift them up. So racial criminalization is stigmatizing people as criminal. It's a way of describing the process of how collective guilt is assigned. Uh, so think that oppressed minority groups all over the world from Dalits um, to Rohingya have been defined as a political threat um, and therefore that's the process of racial criminalization. In the United States, African-Americans have borne this burden, but other groups have come in and out of this from Chinese immigrants in the late 19th century. Racial criminalization does not, by definition, lead to mass criminalization or even mass incarceration. Um, mass criminalization generally refers to taking stigma and translating it into law. And so the law can become a blunt instrument of control in the ex example that we'll cover very briefly after reconstruction, uh, what slavery did, uh, law took over. And so whereas once the rules of chattel slavery, um, the inscribing of black people's humanity in the context of a system of property laws um, that were protected by uh, a series of other forms of economic infrastructure. After that all breaks down, and of course, this means that we get a 13th Amendment, a loophole, and the possibility for being arrested as a suspect um, leads to mass criminalization where the law itself, the criminal justice law, is a form of coercion, keeps people in their place. Um, and then finally, mass incarceration, which is the term that nearly everyone knows is common parlance these days, is imprisoning as many people as possible, literally. Um, and so the difference between mass criminalization, which takes place mostly over the course of the 20th century, um, and the difference between mass incarceration, which takes place beginning in the 1970s, is the difference as to whether you use the law to compel people to a second class form of citizenship by threat of punishment, or whether you lock up as many people as possible. Um, so I'll keep it moving. I also think it's really helpful for students um, when you're engaging a weighty topic like this to meet them where they are. And so according to research, almost every student in America has heard or read the I Have a Dream speech. Uh, and so it might surprise them if teachers haven't paused for parts of the speech that are often less the focus of annual memorialization uh, to read the part where he talks about police brutality. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. Uh, and so it's a nice entryway uh, into demythologizing King as an appropriate kind of speaker, a respectable civil rights leader, not like those kids who are not the peaceful protesters that we imagine um, should be very humble and uh, obey the, the law and support change in the political process, et cetera. Uh, King himself obviously engaged in civ acts of civil disobedience. He broke injunctions against protest, uh, but he also clearly understood uh, that police brutality was a central problem uh, in his time. It didn't just emerge more recently. And so now we're gonna take a deeper dive into the past. Um, since you've heard the Through Line podcast, I won't, have, I won't go through you know, every narrative story. Uh, you've done your homework. The point here is to sort of do a little bit of show um, instead of telling, uh, because I think one of the challenges always in uh, your classrooms is what kinds of documents do you bring into the conversation? And so the first one I thought would just be, um, some of you probably already teach the Atlantic slave trade, um, but you might not think about teaching the Atlantic slave trade in relation to policing. Uh, and so I think they're indispensable because 
What's important to understand about the problem of policing is that it was broken from the beginning. It was never uh, something that was simply about uh, protecting and serving the public regardless of status in society. Policing was always about policing the essential workers of uh, the Americas, but the world by and large. And it certainly becomes a more acute uh, power dynamic through the lens of policing in the context of the quote unquote new world. Um, so as 10.5 million slaves arrive in South America and North America, uh, 600,000 of whom end up in the British colonies, Charleston, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, um, the need to establish surveillance and control over this subjected oppressed population is what gives rise to robust forms of lawmaking and uh, policing. So it might come as a surprise that the tallest structure in New York City uh, in the 1700s was a sugar house uh, refinery. Again, sugar was one of the products of the enslaved, which represented the most dominant economic activity of all of South America, Central America, um, not so much North America because of the climate um, north of Louisiana. But essentially what brought Europeans to the Americas was in fact sugarcane production and other things flowed from there. Uh, so New York City, um, unlike the typical story of slavery, um, is deeply invested in this economy. And uh, as is true today, if you ask your students, you know, how would you measure the importance of our built environment? You say, well, what's the tallest building? Uh, and so Trinity Church on the west side of the Hudson River of New York City um, was a representation, of course, of the Episcopalian church's um, might and cultural significance, uh, as well as religion itself. And on the other side, on the East River, where the uh, slave traffic and uh, the global exchange of commodities, uh, just about one of every two uh, boat entering the New York Harbor contained sugar or enslaved people. Uh, and so the Rhineland and Sugar House refinery um, was one of the tallest structures to represent that trade. And then, of course, how perfectly fitting that the same place that was so intimately tied to the enslavement of others um, is now today the site upon which the New York City Police Department rests. So, uh, of course, um, as you all know, slavery evolved over time. It didn't start out uh, with all the rules written um, or uh, understood. And so what happens gradually from the 17th century to the 18th century is an ever increasing uh, intensification of the restrictions on enslaved people because they were always human beings, never lost their status as human beings. They tried to make joy out of difficult moments out of difficult lives. They found ways to create community. They found ways to have children. They found ways to engage in sports and leisure. Uh, and for every act of their humanity was a counter act to diminish or reduce it uh, in law. And so by 1731, not South Carolina, uh, not Virginia, but this is New York City's um, slave code, no Negro, mulatto, or Indian slaves above the number of three do assemble or meet together on the Lord's Day called Sunday in sport, play or make a noise or disturbance or at any other time at any place from their master service within the city. So when you pass laws, you generally need to enforce those laws. And so the enforcement is where the police come in. And so sometime between the 17th century and the late 1600s uh, into the early 18th century, do we begin to see the increased presence of slave patrols. Uh, these are individuals who are required to serve a tour of duty often for a year uh, they represent every status, particularly in the South, where the vast majority of African Americans by the 19th century will reside. Um, gradual abolition laws diminish over time the footprint of slavery in Northern colonies. But make no mistake about it, slave patrols and slave catchers were everywhere in the colonies in the 1600s and 1700s. This example comes from Louisiana. Um, and so uh, again, uh, we often think of the only bad people are racist. Um, and we often think only Southerners are racist. So we're now disrupting two myths. Here is a Baptist minister in Louisiana. Uh, he's the slave patrol captain. You could have uh, landed men, landless men, slave owning men, non-slave holding men. Uh, this was a product, a project of uh, the socialization of whiteness 
particularly for white men who had the collective responsibility of protecting their communities from insurrection or rebellion by the enslaved populations. Uh, and your duty was uh, significant enough that you could be punished for not serving uh, on the slave patrol when uh, required to do so. Solomon Northrup, another great uh, primary source, the uh, author of 12 Years a Slave, had this to say about slave patrollers, patrollers whose business it is to seize and whip any slave they may find wandering from the plantation, ride on horseback, headed by a captain, armed and accompanied by dogs. They have the right either by law or by general consent to inflict discretionary chastisements upon a black man caught beyond the boundaries of his master's estate without a pass, and even to shoot him if he attempts to escape. Each company has a certain distance to ride up and down the bayou. Fled, one slave fled before one of these companies thinking he could reach his cabin before they could overtake him. But one of their dogs, a great ravenous hound, ripped him by the leg and held him fast. The patrollers whipped him severely. So again, you can't get more expressive in a primary document in describing the actual point, purpose, and mecha mechanics of slave patrols. And also you, you, you can teach students here that the act of dis dispensing with summary punishment or what will later be called a curbside beating um, or contempt of cop beatings. What we see when police officers literally abuse a person uh, when in the act of arrest, they, they, haven't, they don't necessarily have the authority to do that except when they are technically subduing a person who is fighting back. Uh, but you can literally raise your voice at a police officer today and he might hit you with a baton or hit you over the head with a gun. The point being that the act of corporal punishment baked into policing is part of the culture of policing that has been there from the very beginning. Um, we think that the police officer's job is to detain, arrest the person, deliver them to a process or due process of justice, but oftentimes that's not what's happening. Uh, of course, slavery didn't last forever and uh, the point of the end of slavery, as I've already suggested in the opening remarks about those key words, is that the rules have to be rewritten. 13th Amendment abolishes slavery except as punishment for a crime. The 14th Amendment comes as a result of a series of black codes which are passed after slavery to reinscribe um, black people as into forms of second class citizenship where they can be accused of crimes quite easily. Um, and the point of that was to say, look, we need you back to work and the simple act of being unemployed or choosing to walk away from an old plantation was considered an act of vagrancy, which could land you on a sheriff's auction block to be resold to the highest bidder, including your former master. And so the elasticity of the criminal justice system overnight um, puts in sharp relief the fact that the criminal justice system now is being engineered to do the work that slavery as a system of laws and practices had already been doing for 250 years before the end of the Civil War. What happens overnight is the dramatic rise in Black incarcerated population, Black arrest statistics, um, and of course all of these uh, artifacts of the oppression of Black people uh, these statistical artifacts are the consequence of policing. You don't, you don't get someone to be arrested or serving time on a convict lease arrangement, which was a way of privatizing punishment and outsourcing the cost of punishment for net revenue back to states, um, which were severely in debt after the Civil War, particularly in the South. You don't get any of that activity without, without law enforcement. So many of us know these images, have seen these images, have taught these images, but we don't often teach these images through the story of policing. So just a, a brief shout out to the statistics game that takes place. Um, what happens fairly quickly is that some really innovative thinkers come along and they say, hey, look, you know, this, this whole problem of black people and their freedom, which of course, a significant part of the country didn't subscribe to. And there is a difference between being anti-slavery and uh, being anti-racist. Um, many people were anti-slavery, but still believed in white supremacist notions. Uh, which is an issue I take up a, a, to great extent in the book. But here I'll just point to the fact that um, we know now, and some people knew then, that you could never take at face value that the arrest statistics of Black people, the activity of the police, was evidence of Black people's criminality. So 
the racial criminalization is what the law is doing when it in increases the ability of the law to, to use vagrancy acts to arrest black people who are trying to negotiate their own economic lives. Mass criminalization is the process of then turning to the statistic to say, black people shouldn't live in certain neighborhoods. Black people shouldn't have access to the same kinds of educational opportunities. Black people are a social threat to a racial intermixture. Those are forms of mass criminalization. Um, and so this is just one of the innovative thinkers of this time period, a man named Frederick Hoffman, who by the way, was in Newark, New Jersey, uh, by the time he wrote this book as the lead actuary, uh, again, disrupting the notion that only bad people are Southern um, and good people can't be racist. This is a man who fancied himself a progressive. He believed in the possibility of helping out low income people in, uh, through uh, smart insurance policies. And yet he fundamentally believed that black people's crime was the smoking gun evidence that they were not qualified for freedom, uh, that they were a threat. And he said the only way out of this for them was not more opportunity and equality. The only way out of it for them was to change their behavior. Um, ironically enough, two years before Frederick Hoffman published those findings, the largest police brutality and the uh, first blue ribbon police brutality investigation and, and one on corruption uh, came from New York City. And in this case, the focus wasn't on anti-black racist policing. The focus here was on inter-ethnic, often um, native born white American against uh, new European immigrant populations, for example, Irish and Italian immigrants. Um, and one of the stories about policing, while I have focused a lot on the big footprint with regard to the institution of slavery, which was the most important economic institution in America uh, until industrialization in the late 19th century, um, it is also the case that in um, commercial cities, in industrial cities by the mid 18th century, we get the first uniform police forces, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, they have the same uniform, they have a badge, they have a weapon to, uh, to subdue suspects. And there's a lot of white on white police violence. Um, and what it really is, is xenophobic nativist violence directed towards the out group at that moment. Uh, and what it leads to is this massive investigation, New York's police described as allies of criminals, the entire department corrupt. I mean, it's pretty remarkable when you think about that headline in terms of the New York Times 125 years ago, because the dithering today about like, oh, most of these police officers are really good people and we just have to tinker at the age, a, edges, you know, it gives you pause when you think about like, what is this thing we've built and we've been holding on to for 125 years, just going back to this report. Uh, so again, not going to dwell too much more on the details. There's like 10,000 uh, pages of testimony that were uh, produced by this, uh, several hundred indictments uh, of corrupt police officers, as well as abuse of police officers. And again, there's very much a race angle to it because a lot of the corruption and brutality is exploiting um, the lowest status European immigrants of the moment. So with regard to what's happening in New York in the 1890s and what's happening in the South, uh, during the post-Reconstruction period. Of course, the convergence happens for Black people when they leave the South and become, begin to come to uh, places like Chicago, New York, et cetera. And here we call this the Great Migration Period. All of you know this period, roughly from 1950 to 1970, six million African-Americans leave Southern farms and cities and search, or as Isabel Wilkerson would say, the warmth of other suns borrowed from Richard Wright. Um, excuse me, this is an era of great possibility for African-Americans and yet they run into the gauntlet of entrenched systemic and institutional racism baked into the geography of Northern cities, which as a process of working through multiple generations of European immigrants begins to uh, define a kind of unitary whiteness. Um, it's not always unitary and it's contextual, but it's clear that being of white skinned and of European descent gives one even privileges within a low income, segregated, uh, what they would have called slum at that time. Most immigrants lived in low income slum communities, but they were heterogeneous 
uh, for the most part. Uh, they, you know, they might have called Little Italy a couple of blocks around um, uh, a Catholic church, uh, a few restaurants, but by and large, Italians live near the Irish, the Irish live near Poles, so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, what happens in Chicago? Black people began to move significantly uh, to the North uh, during World War I. There's great demand for labor, you know the story. And out of this uh, shifting demographic population, a series of uh, urban uh, race riots occur. And in this language, race riots meant whites attacking black people uh, who they view as threats to their sense of self-worth, to their cultural control over community, to the economic uh, spoils of an industrial economy that uh, is grinding industrial workers in general. And black people often show up in these places as contingent workers, as strike breakers, um, because corporations will use black people by recruiting them into these jobs for the purposes of breaking the union stronghold. Uh, and so there's tremendous uh, racial animus um, and anti-black racism, and it leads to an explosion of race riots in the red summer of, of 1919. What comes out of that is the first Blue Ribbon Commission to focus on anti-black uh, police brutality. And here is what these folks found. They found that criminal justice officials were more likely to arrest Negroes more freely than whites, to book them on more serious charges, to convict them more readily, and to give them longer sentences. One judge stated that he personally knew about certain police who were going into clubs and arresting Negroes they found there, bringing them into court without a bit of evidence of any offense. Another judge discussed why large numbers of Blacks were arrested for suspicion, attributing to a lesser regard for the rights of Black men compared to white men. I think they hesitate a little longer. A former chief of police agreed, noting that Southern migrants naturally attracted greater suspicion than would attach to the white men who would live for a greater length of time in the same district and who also would be more easily identified and traced. So this is about as explicit a set of findings about systemic racism and bias directed towards African-Americans as you could assemble. Just as 25 years before in New York City, we found that police officers were absolutely incapable of dispensing or administering justice um, fairly. And so it wasn't fair then, 25 years later, it's not fair, but it's also particularly racist when it comes to black people. And that riot was violent uh, in every dimension. And police officers in the midst of that violence spent more of their time stopping, frisking, and searching black people than they did the actual instigators and provocateurs of the violence itself. And so again, these are the people we've been consistently relying upon uh, to serve and protect communities as if they uh, then or now were ever committed to some kind of anti-racist, colorblind, imagined um, fairness in our society. So uh, this particular finding is really potentially radical. It basically says that because we know there's so much racism in policing, we can't trust crime statistics because we know that police officers are not behaving fairly and therefore why would we depend upon crime statistics? So one of the America's leading criminologists says that the statistics were completely unreliable. Of course, as you'll see in a few minutes, um, we've gone and taken crime statistics to a whole nother level. We've tripled down on them. Um, other people began to study. They're inspired by the report. The report was, was called The Negro in Chicago, published in 1922, whose lead author was a Black sociologist named Charles S. Johnson. He was associated with the National Urban League. And so here, a Black woman named Anna Thomas does a similar uh, deeper dive on Philadelphia. She finds over arrest of Black people charged with suspicious characters, calls them needless arrests. People picked up on the stoops of their own home. Another researcher, Ira D.A. Reed, visits many other cities. So by the 1920s, for the first time, going back to the 1600s, we began to see a counter narrative, a critique, a kind of Black Lives Matter focus on police violence, brutality, and racism in policing that has the potential uh, to fix policing um, a century ago. Other people, this is a Southern white sociologist who was involved in an interracial Southern organization, Commission on Interracial Cooperation, 1925, makes the same observation, high-handed arrest of colored people is extremely galling to the law-abiding citizen. It cannot be excused on any other ground than ignorance and inefficiency of police officers who engage in these practices and indifference of the citizens who permit such officers to remain on the job. 
Illinois does a crime survey. It found that Black people are being killed by the police at six times the rate of their population. It gives a couple of examples. In this case, a young man who had been accused of shoplifting. Police go to his home. Um, when they burst through the door, they kill the kid with 35 gunshot wounds. Um, Ida B. Wells herself described this as a heinous example of police executions. Uh, black people like Kelly Miller, like Charles S. Johnson, like Ida B. Wells, uh, began to center policing as part of their critique. So here we are in the 1930s. We're still 30 years before Dr. King refers to policing in his I Have a Dream speech, and yet Dr. King is six years old at this point. So the convergence of the growing um, anti-racist organizing and critique of policing is going to eventually segue with the civil rights movement. Here, uh, Kelly Miller, who's at Howard University, talks about how policing is basically the, the most significant representation of the state, of our government. It is the blunt instrument of defining the diminished citizenship of Black people, and that if we reverse this pattern, Black people would actually feel like they belong in our society, would have a stake in our society, would trust in authorities and trust in government. And so when we hear again today uh, notions that homicide rates are very high in the Black community and police officers have a hard time clear clearing those cases, which is the technical term for solving a murder case. Often and almost only the police blame the community for not divulging information about suspects. <laughs> but of course, a community that has this history of policing is going to be very untrusting of that organization. And so police are putting blame, um, just like Frederick Hoffman put blame on Black people uh, for these failures. Here's just a firsthand witness. You won't find this in, in any uh, 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 online search. This comes from the NAACP archives. Uh, a black man named George Fald was describing a scene of police brutality in a letter that he wrote to the NAACP, noting it has been going on for some time, not only in the station house, but on the street. I can recall several instances in which I have been an eyewitness. He tells the story of a young man who was being chased by an officer and the officer literally was cursing at the kid. And this man, George Fall, said, hey, man, there's women and children on the streets. Could you not do that? What, what did the kid do anyway? Um, and the cop turned and cursed at him and then withdrew his, uh, or drew his revolver, pointed it at the kid in his back. This is all described by Fall in this letter, but didn't shoot. And so he's writing. And he said, how if the officer had nothing on the boy, had he, had he the right to molest him? We need to have justice to those whose justice deserve. Uh, so this is a firsthand testimony. Other kinds of testimonies of policing extend into political commentary. This is a, a Philadelphia Tri Tribune cartoon, a home of, the, of a Philadelphia taxpayer of color. What I love about this is in our contemporary moment of taxpayer rights and how people, as Mitt Romney famously said in 2012, there's takers and makers. Um, here is Black people owning the space of being respectable, law-abiding homeowners who pay taxes, and yet their white neighbors come there to literally violently remove them from the neighborhood. And what do the police do? They stand idly by while the violence is being directed towards the respectable Black person and blames the Black person for having moved into that neighborhood. So this is, again, the critique of policing, and this was published in 1929. The federal government produced a national commission that looked at law and, and, and uh, observance um, called the Wickersham Commission, which was for the then Attorney General, George B. Wickersham. The report produced 13 volumes and they covered everything in the system, way more than just policing. But one of them looked at police violence called third degree. It was uh, some of you who know Perry Mason or know that term from uh, generations ago. The third degree was the term given to when police officers uh, engaged in mild torture tactics to get a confession from someone. And so they looked at this problem going back to the Lexo Commission, which they had the best evidence they had of its wide scale use, um, except they didn't mention any kind of police brutality directed towards Black people. And so uh, Philadelphia Tribune stepped in again and said somebody told a lie about the decrease in police brutality. Northern police brutality was ignored while highlighting the sensational cases from the uncivilized wilds of Mississippi. What they're partly saying is we keep ignore, ignoring racism and policing outside of the South. 
What about local cases of the beating of a sickly elderly black woman, the torture of a man choked, hung upside down, his joints twisted and told that Negroes should be treated like dogs and the drag net arrest of Negroes on the steps of their own homes. 500 more cases even worse than these. So there's an invisibility, there's an unwillingness to take on the mounting evidence. And of course the evidence keeps existing. Uh, in the case of the Harlem uprising, which occurs in 1930s, it starts with a uh, false rumor that a child had been, uh, Lino Rivera had been beaten and killed um, by a police officer um, and all hell breaks, breaks loose uh, in Harlem. It's the first uprising that we, today we might call um, an up, a, a, a rebellion where the animus is directed towards the police and to property often owned by non-Blacks. Um, and I won't read through all of this just in the interest of time, but the Harlem riot uh, is a, a really rich document, just like the Negro in Chicago. That's published in 1922. This is published in 1935. They say similar things about the larger context in which police officers are on the front edge of policing the systemic racism that Afri African Americans are experiencing. I should say it differently. They're policing Black people's resistance to and lack of compliance to the systemic racism. Uh, that is in effect. Um, they do a deeper dive and the only point to make here and looking at it is they're going to take on the accusation that black people have a crime problem and that the, therefore the crime problem justifies the policing behavior. But what they find is if you can see my mouse that out of 6,000 uh, male initiated arrests, only 0.5% of them are for homicide and 5% are for felonious assault. When they look amongst women, they see just shy of 4% for quote unquote violent crime. What they're policing is the same thing the Southerners were policing. They're policing the movements, the comings and goings of black people and deciding that just like the Negro codes of back in the day, that various forms of play and sport are not legitimate for black people. This we will see recur again and again. I might also add that according to the Vera Institute of Justice, there were 10.5 million arrests in the United States last year. The percentage of arrests for violent crimes, 5%. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from there. This is, a, this is more, what I'm really showing you is how rich the documents are for teaching purposes. Rich quotations, rich descriptions, rich analysis, um, gives a real sense of the dynamics that are playing out. Here's a firsthand testimony of someone who's beaten by the police and yet he's charged with felonious assault. He's the victim of police brutality, um, and, but he's the one now being charged. And uh, there's a description at the very end uh, that he, you know, someone called a hospital to take him in to get care. Another person called the police wagon. Um, but then when they both showed up, the police officer had cleaned up his face, take the blood off and take him to jail. Uh, so he did not get the medical attention he deserved. So what did they find? They came to the same conclusions as the Chicago uh, police report came to. Police show too little regard for human rights. Police aggressions and brutalities more than any other factor weld the people together for mass action. It is clearly the responsibility of the police to act in such a way as to win the confidence of the citizens of Harlem. This is not a, this is not a, a false equivalency. Police officers as representatives of the state have the responsibility to serve and protect and to prove their worthiness, not the other way around, which is often how police and particularly police unions today think of uh, what the public owes them. Private prejudices are no warrant for interfering with uh, relations between whites and blacks. And then finally, officers who violate the law should be subject to investigation and punishment by the police. That action should be taken just as vigorously as where any other person is charged with a crime. And then comes the Carner Commission report. So chapter 11, another rich uh, document. Uh, the policeman in the ghetto is the most visible symbol, finally, of a society from which many ghetto Negroes are increasingly alienated. The schools, to speak to something uh, one of uh, the folks mentioned, um, the schools, because so many are segregated, old and inferior, religion, which has become irrelevant to those who have lost faith, that they have lost hope, career aspirations, which for many young Negroes are totally lacking, the family, because its bonds are so often snapped, it is the policeman who must deal with the consequences of this institutional vacuum and is then resented for the presence and the measures this effort demands. In a nutshell, because of systemic racism across all sectors of society, police then are on the front lines of ensuring that black people stay in their place. Okay, I'm gonna skip these, just more from 
uh, the report. If any of you saw the John Oliver uh, show, you might have noted this wonderful quote that um, John Oliver featured from Kenneth Clark, but which is quoted in my book, which he basically says, if we go back to Chicago, if we look at the Harlem riot report, if we look at another report in 1943, if we look at what happened in Watts in 1965, it's the same old story, the same analysis, the same recommendations, the same inaction over and over again. So you don't just have to take Khalil's historical interpretation word for it, someone who had lived his life and who by then was half a century old and who could then have a sense of his own historical journey could see the same pattern that we're talking about today. So they made the same recommendations. I won't even go over them again because they're, they're the same. Um, and here we are. This is our contemporary moment. So remember I said we tripled down on crime statistics. And so we had the self-defined liberal mayor of New York build the biggest system of racial profiling and stop and frisk policing the world has ever known. Just to, again, so you don't think it's all uh, mumble jumbo. Notice uh, in the Kerner Commission, they actually use the language indiscriminate stops and searches. Okay, I think you've got that point. So what do we see over the course of uh, 12 years under Michael Bloomberg? This is how stop and frisks went from small to large, which resulted in 4.4 million people being stopped over the course of this period. What's fascinating about this, three things. The first is in the top graph, you'll notice that the so-called need for stop and frisk to keep people from killing each other remains flat. Felony arrests uh, uh, never see a substantial downturn. I mean, there's you, you could, to be most generous, you could say between 1999 and 2003 is a downturn, but they're mostly flat. So we don't see this kind of thing where felony arrests go down like this. What we do see is a dramatic increase in summonses, not even misdemeanor arrests. So what are people getting summonses for? Here we go. Consumption of alcohol, disorderly conduct, public urination, bicycles on sidewalks. So this is what police officers have been doing. This is why New York City has needed 40,000 police officers, more police officers than some small countries. And who's been stopped? 90% being Latino or Black. And then we get to Ferguson. I'm going to stop uh, there because you know the story of Ferguson, um, but I can take some questions so we have enough time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I suspect that we have a lot of questions and uh, we have just over 10 minutes. So I would like to encourage us to get started with the uh, the chat box, but I will also be happy to take questions with those of you who uh, raise your little blue hands. That was an enormous amount of really uh, difficult and rich material. And so I suspect all of you um, are really working to very hard to process that right now. Um, Julia, I wonder if you would jump in and pose your question. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Professor, for all that incredible information. Um, I know that a big takeaway that you posit is that due to this history, um, police departments are incredibly unwilling to change. And I know with a lot of the calls for defunding the police and abolishing the police, um, there have been a lot of suggestions put forward for what a non-police state looks like, right? Like, what does New York City look like without police? What do all these other cities look like? Um, and I'd love to hear your take on that. Like, what do you think our community looks like without police? How should we be rethinking ways to support communities um, in based on a completely radically different model that's not steeped in white supremacy? Yeah, so, I mean, just in the interest of time, because... That's a slightly different question for this community. I'll cite uh, Miriam Kaba, um, wrote a wonderful piece in the New York Times. Uh, I've given an interview in the Washington Post about defund. I mean, more or less, the, the simple, the simple non-police state is that um, we either have no policing whatsoever or we have policing um, to take care of people who are truly violent and are threatening life. But clearly, police, the vast majority of police officers from every form of evidence we actually have um, are not policing violent people. <laughs> uh, 
They're policing people going about their lives. They may be, quote unquote, breaking certain kinds of vice laws and status offense laws, which themselves have been used as an instrument of control. The, the wider discretion you give lawmakers to define something as a crime, the more likely you are to suppress those people in ways that limit their freedom, going back to the Negro Codes of 1731 to criminalize forms of black movement, play and leisure. And so we're seeing the same thing. Poor people are subjected to street level enforcement of the very things that affluent people get to do in the privacy of their own homes, gated communities or their lovely backyards. Um, so we can come up with a very long list of things that police officers should no longer be policing. Uh, in addition to a very long list of social services that have been subject to divestment and austerity measures um, in the name of increasing public safety as the first and most important thing the government should do, which is itself a part of a, a very Republican set of ideas that have really taken root over the last 40 years. The government should do less, less and less, except more and more policing or more and more public safety. Gloria, I'm wondering if you would like to pose the question you, you wrote in the chat. Sure, so, once, so thank you so much. So my, my students are a little bit different. So I work with principals and superintendents. Uh, so in thinking about my students, uh, something that jumped out at me was a quote from Kelly Miller about that relationship between policing and the impact on belonging, which obviously as a black person who New York City native, like I, that, I re that resonated for me, like on a cellular level. But I wonder, has there, what are, if there, you had any more thoughts on that, or there was more that um, from the longer text, because I see that interplay really clearly in schools of, well, these are the folks who um, always get suspended. Let's look at them in a vacuum, as opposed to what are we doing to create this, um, this culture of over suspending. <laughs> um, so I just want, I'm just wondering about that. That's resonating with me right now. Yeah, I mean, you, you answered your own question in posing the question, uh, which is great. I mean, that's not a put down. It's just to say that it's obvious that, uh, so, so I'll give you a historical example. So I have a graduate student who wrote a book called Presumed Criminal, and it focuses on the juvenile justice system. That's the name of the book, Presumed Criminal. And he's, his name is Carl Sudler. And what he found is that in the 1940s, police officers began to very intentionally um, expand their, their uh, footprint in black migrant communities. These are black children of migrants coming from South Carolina and uh, other parts of the Eastern seaboard into New York City. And they do this under the heading of police athletic leagues, POW clubs and basketball programs. Now, everyone knows these things exist in the present, but this is when it's happening for the first time. And what it becomes is this mechanism of like, you know, we're going to show these kids we are the good people. They're not the stereotypes that they think we are, that they can trust us. But what are they actually doing? <laughs> they're actually surveilling the kids and they're making a list of the kids they consider troublemakers so that it's a lot easier to find them later and to punish them. Um, and so while we could say, well, okay, I could see the reasonableness of that on one hand and maybe the wrongness on the other, what it essentially leads to is that decade after decade, police officers take on more and more of the function of social work. And so you know this today as if a school has a tight budget, are they going to pay for more security measures or are they going to pay for more guidance counselors? they're gonna pay for more guidance counsel, I'm sorry, more security measures. And then they're gonna ask the officers to be nice with the kids, uh, to, um, to, to nay nay with them, um, you know, to, to be friendly with them. And so we've outsourced essentially youth appropriate development infrastructure to police officers because it kills two birds with one stone. And of course, everyone is willing to pay for more police officers. The guidance counselor, social work stuff, not so much. We can't really afford that. So that's what I mean, you've answered your own, you've answered your own question. We need far fewer representation of security measures and policing. Now, people will often say, well, what happens when this, this, and this happens? Well, the truth is that on one hand, with a lot more guidance counselors and social workers, you can prevent those things from happening because the kid who's in trouble can get help. 
The other thing is we have public health measures amongst violence interrupters and other community organizations that actually do intervene through conflict mediation and restorative justice practices before anybody even needs to call the police. So we have a lot of options uh, on the table. So Tim, you also had a question about schools. Would you like to jump in? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thanks, Dr. Muhammad. It's great seeing like your face, you know what I'm saying? Like you're like a faceless guy when I'm reading and I'm also hearing of the, uh, in the documentary and it's just great seeing your mug, you know what I'm saying? It was just, um, <laughs> thank you so much for like that, that fire hydrant of a, of a presentation. You know, I'm with you, I'm engaged with you all throughout. You did answer some parts of my question of the last question. It has to do with like the, um, you know, the role of disciplinary measures within schools. Um, I particularly liked this idea. Well, I didn't like it. You know, I mean, it was much more revealed in a, in a precise way in the documentary, this deputization of white men and the duty to dole out corporal punishment. And obviously we don't hit kids, right? But there's still this, um, this uh, deputization, let's say, of uh, deans or like uh, school personnel to, to give out whatever demerits or like, you know, timeouts or like some sort of punishment. And I'm wondering if you could speak more on the role of, uh, you know, de-deputizing um, school personnel um, and I know, I mean, I see, I, I, you know, I see people in here that I recognize from like restorative justice kind of circles. I mean, Caitlin, like, I, I remember you from doing like really good work in your schools about like restorative justice circles and all that. But I'm wondering, Dr. Muhammad, if you could talk more about like the de-deputization of school personnel, because I'm at this point right now, I mean, I'm going to keep it real of just leaving the schools. You know, like this kind of um, exodus, this, you know, like from these systems that are just so fraught with their own history of slave patrols. I mean, it's modern day slave patrols going around in the schools, you know, and like walking the beat in the hallways, making yeah. sure kids are like right now probably, you know, socially distancing or whatever. You know, I can't even imagine the new ecosystem a decaying one that we're going into. So I'm yeah. just going to say that right now. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, Tim, I appreciate the question. And I mean, I think that some of these questions are being taken up by a lot of different people um, who, I mean, who, whose work falls roughly within the category of school to prison pipeline research. And I'm going to mention two people uh, to recommend for further um, inspection of their work. And that is Carla Shedd, um, and I can't remember Carla's name of her book right now, but this is squarely in her wheelhouse. Uh, she is at the CUNY Graduate Center, Carla Shedd, Shedd with two Ds. And the other is Monique Morris's work, Push Out, which focuses specifically on the experiences of black girls in these systems. But it's long been the case that, that schooling as an institution has also been uh, a coercive or carceral space. Um, the regimen of discipline and silence it looks very similar in school as it does in prison itself. And the notion somehow that we could make predictive claims about the literacy level of children at very young ages tells us who we should be investing in and who we should not be investing in. This is part of the neoliberal logic that has shaped all of American society and indeed much of global capitalism for the past 40 years. This idea that you know, once a person has shown their talent or lack thereof, then they become redundant. And what do you do with redundancy? Um, you either profit from it, which is the way that um, people like Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about organized abandonment creates profit centers, or Naomi Klein talks about disaster capitalism. What we look at as crisis, other people look at as opportunity to make money. And so redundant laborers end up in warehouse prisons, which then outsource their labor either to the state or to private contractors, um, and also justifies the divestment of the state in other kinds of resources, i.e. affordable housing, public education, so on and so forth. So, uh, so I just want to mention those two books because they're more specifically about these issues and what to do about them. Wonderful. We are nearly out of time, um, but we have a, uh, at least one question about the history that you uh, covered 
And Amy, I'm wondering if you could very quickly pose your question. Yeah, I think Dr. Muhammad kind of answered it when I was talking about like between the 1930s and the 1960s. I've just read Elizabeth Hinton's book mm -hmm. about like how both Democratic and Republican administrations advanced like mass uh, criminalization and mass incarceration. Um, so I think he kind of answered it. Um, Carla had a question that I think was about like refuting like people's arguments today about why police are still necessary. So I'd kind of rather hear Carla ask her question. Great. Carla, would you like to jump in? All right. Um, so yes, my question was like, how do we change the narrative? Because right now in New York City, with the spike in crime, people are saying, oh, you know, we have a spike in crime because um, we don't have slap and frisk anymore and because of bail reform. So how can we change that narrative? What can we do? Yeah. You know, um, a lot of people spend, are spending a lot of time thinking about, about disrupting the narrative. I mean, the narrative has changed for people who want to have a different uh, set of ideas, beliefs, and responses, right? I mean, that's partly what we've seen in the wake of the Floyd protest, biggest, most significant uh, racial justice protest in history. Um, what you're really talking about is uh, the population of people who are committed to state violence, no matter what the statistics say. I mean, um, no one can make the associations that they're making uh, with upticks in violence by any standard that the same people would use statistically to argue for um, more punishment. What I mean by that is you, the police will just simply say, see, the people we let out on bail are the ones committing crime, but there's no evidence of that. Period. I mean, you'd have to literally find the same exact people and track the exact same, and they don't have any of that evidence. So what essentially police officers are saying, they've always said, which is that if we don't get the kind of immunity that we have to do what we do, then the purge will be the state of society and everyone will be killed. I mean, th that's what they say. <laughs> so um, I don't know that we can actually change that narrative for the police or for the people who believe in policing in that way. What we have to continue to do is to have meaningful, informed, educated uh, conversations and teaching tools to teach our students, our children, and our colleagues and peers so that we build different systems uh, that are less vulnerable to the kind of uh, racist, bigoted, narrowed, uh, punitive views that have for so long dominated American political culture. I mean, the, the good news is that that narrative is weakening. The bad news is that it is so deeply entrenched in American society. Um, it's like a virus that uh, keeps, keeps changing um, complexity and gets stronger uh, at times and weaker, depending on what the context is of its hosts. So we have to build up our immunities to it in ways that make us less vulnerable to its impact. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we'll have to wrap up with our questions there. Um, and before we say goodbye to those of you in our Zoom meeting today, I'd like to thank those of you who joined us by live stream. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and we look forward to seeing you again. For those of you who are on Zoom with us, um, I, I only wish we could keep this meeting going um, because clearly we have lots of questions and there's a lot to say about what's happened. And